Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The market moving event of the morning is University of Michigan sentiment. It is one of my favorite indicators. It's definitely my desert island indicator. This is the preliminary <laughs> read uh, for June. And you're looking at the index, 65.6. That's a seven-month low. Current conditions, low. Expectations falling. One-year inflation expectations rising to 3.3. Uh, Joanne Shu is the University of Michigan Surveys of Consumers Director, and she joins us now. Joanne, what led this decline? I think we need to look back one more month to really understand what's going on. Between April and May, consumer sentiment dropped about 10%. And between May and June, um, it's essentially flat. Um, yes, it's a little lower between June and May, but really um, it's within this ma margin of error and we should interpret that as no change. But what happened um, this month was that it, compared to last month, consumers were uh, getting worried that labor markets were starting to weaken. They were worried that interest rates were not moving in the right direction um, and that the inflation slowdown wasn't really happening high and fast enough. And that's exactly how consumers continue to feel right now. Um, those concerns uh, remain in place and, um, and consumers don't really see a material change in the economy between last month and this month. Joanne, it seems like, uh, again, inflation, we hear it in, you know, some of the political polling uh, that we see. Um, we see it in, uh, you know, some of the uh, other, uh, I think, surveys that we see. It's still a big, big issue for consumers, even if the rate of inflation is slowing. Those higher pricing levels are, are really problematic, aren't they? That's absolutely right. The share of consumers that are telling us that high prices are eroding their living standards remains quite high. Um, and in fact, it did go up between um, May and June. However, consumers have noticed that inflation has slowed and that bears out in the inflation expectations that, that have come down quite dramatically over the last two years and, and even in the last last six months or so. Um, however, consumers you know, aren't really sure that inflation is going to continue decelerating at, um, at a pace that they would like. Um, and, you know, there are aspects of inflation that continue to be really troublesome, in particular, the cost of housing and insurance. Um, th these are things that are going to continue to weigh on consumers, even if gas prices come down or food prices come, uh, food, no, gas yeah. prices come down and food inflation comes down. Now, of course, this happened, though, before the Fed meeting this week, when we sort of got more insight into the dot plot and sort of whatever cuts we may get. Would consumers feel materially different, maybe on your second read based off of that or no? It's possible that they may feel different at the end of the month, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, interpret any change between now and the final reading as attributable to uh, the Fed policy announcements um, and and uh, the FOMC meeting uh, consequences. You know, consumers aren't really paying attention to that. Um, what they will pay attention to is, you know, if if they're starting to feel some relief um, as they are working through their budgets, um, and if they are starting to see any sort of positive developments or continued strength in labor markets. Um, the the big deterioration in labor market expectations that began in in May, um, you know, was on the heels of some weakening jobs reports, and um, and and so we'll we'll see um, what consumers' experiences are like through the rest of the month. Very good. Joanne, thank you so much for joining us. Joanne Shu, she's a Surveys of Consumers Director at the University of Michigan. Not just good football players, but good economists as well. So that's what we like at the U University of Michigan. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Joining us now, Harold Krent. He is a professor of law at Chicago Kent College of Law, the author of the book Presidential Powers. Um, Harold, we appreciate you jumping on with us. So the news, of course, is a bump stock ban is tossed out by the Supreme Court. Um, walk us through what you know, what you've seen, and your reaction. Yeah, I mean, I think your, your discussion of it was right on point. There's a 1934 statute called the National Firearms Act, which bans machine guns. And so the question is whether this altered semi-automatic uh, shotgun resembles 
a machine gun. It does in many ways because it fires automatically. However, it looks different and its trigger mechanism is slightly different in terms of how many times you have to press it before you can shoot um, a large number of shots. So it functions identically to a machine gun, though it works slightly differently. And so the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms and Tobacco is the agency in charge of regulating um, guns in our, in our federal system. And it has changed its mind about whether a bump stock is equivalent to a machine gun or not. Originally, it said that it was distinct from a machine gun and so did not um, outlaw use of the bump stock under the National Firearms Act. But after the Las Vegas tragedy, as you suggested, it was indeed the agency under the Trump administration, which had a fresh look on and on the qualities and uh, characteristics of this bump stock and said, you know, because it functions so similarly to a machine gun, we are going to classify it as a machine gun and therefore consider it banned under the act. And the 6-3 conservative majority um, basically was not persuaded and read machine gun in that sort of narrow context, gave no deference to the agency whatsoever and concluded therefore that a bump stock was not a machine gun and therefore the agency had overstepped its bounds in trying to ban it. So, Professor, I know we're just minutes into this, but I mean, what are the practical ramifications of this decision today? Well, if, if we want to ban um, bump stocks, you, it has to be from Congress. Uh, Congress is the only then, uh, I don't think that there would be an issue under the Second Amendment. Obviously, somebody could raise it, but I think you know grenades and machine guns are not the kind of usual weapons that were around at the founding. And so therefore, presumably they can be banned by Congress, but it can't be through an act of an administration. Um, it has to be from our elected representatives themselves. Do we learn anything about how the court voted and what the opinion looks like in relation to the other gun case uh, that is on the docket for them? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's any kind of seeds or any kind of clues about what's going to happen in Rahimi, which um, I, you know, I agree is, is, is far more controversial uh, case. But this is sort of a, you know, if, if you look at this case from on high, it's sort of remarkable, right? I mean, a bump stock converts a shotgun into something that is automatically firing and has the same characteristics as a machine gun. And if we can ban machine guns, but we don't think that's needed for uh, you know hunting or any other kind of lawful use of a weapon, um, then I don't understand. It, it sort of defies belief that six of our justices rejected an agency decision under the Trump administration that classifies these bump stocks as a, a converting a shotgun into a machine gun. So, Professor, how rare or unusual are 6-3 decisions like this in terms of party lines uh, being so you know, rigidly followed? How do you think about that in, just in the, in the history of the Supreme Court? Yeah, and I don't have great statistics going, going back in terms of the set sort of um, you know, conservative, liberal fishers within the Supreme Court, but we've certainly seen uh, periods of time where the voting structures are comparable to this, where there is a, a block on one side and a block on the other, and only, and the cases are more interesting, of course, when their, the sides come together or they have sort of innovative um, decisions that bridge the gap and you can get a majority of liberal, conservative um, together. So it, it does reflect the fact that there is polarization and there's no question about it. Um, and the 6-3 is, is, you know, obviously was true on the Dobbs case and the abortion case and, and many others. And we'll, we'll, we'll continue to see it. There, there was another case decided mm -hmm. today that had to do with the rights of immigrants to get a um, second hearing at an asylum. And it was not a major case on the, on the asylum law because it had to do with how defective the notice was for a defective notice for a hearing, whether or not um, they should be allowed, if it's defective, to have another notice for a hearing before they're deported. Um, but once again, 6-3 split. Yeah. So it's not surprising, and I think we're going to see more of these in the next uh, 20 or so opinions that are to come. Um, when you take a look at the rest of the docket for the Supreme Court, what are you focused on most uh, in terms of how, what, what it will tell you, either about the court makeup or the ramifications? Well, I, to me, and, and since I do focus on, on administrative law, uh, how 
set that this court is to dismantle our traditional notion of what administrative agencies are and, and how administrations can regulate the environment and regulate the business sector. Those, there are at least three extremely important uh, cases that are pending and they have the seeds in them of radically reshaping how our government works because if you take away the powers of these governing administrative agencies, there'll be a lot less regulation and a lot less regulation uh, can mean Obviously, in most people, more pollution, more pr practices by businesses that hurt uh, individuals, and that's what is really gaining my focus. So, Professor, here, I, presumably, <clears throat> does the Supreme Court, do they care how the public views them, or are they really just pure independent, they're there for life type of thing? <laughs> you know, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think they care in one one way, I mean, Chief Justice Roberts in particular has been known for trying to shore the institutional respect um, of the court. Uh, but a lot of the members of the court, and obviously it's, if you want to name names, I mean, uh, it's no secret that Justice uh, Alito in, in particular um, is of the view that I have power. I don't know how long I'm going to have this power. This is a unique moment in history where we can really contribute to uh, the rearranging the way the government works. And he'll do that and doesn't care at all about what people think of him. So I think there is a, a split amongst the, and I think uh, Justice Barrett is probably with Chief Justice Roberts that they do care about the institutional legitimacy of the court. Um, but there are some members of the court who just want to take the moment in the sun and use the power to the best way they can to shape America in their image. All right, well, we really appreciate your instant analysis here for us, Harold Krent. He's professor of law at Chicago Kent College of Law and author of the book Presidential Powers. Again, that breaking news uh, that in a 6-3 vote along ideological lines, uh, the Supreme Court voted a criminal prohibition put in place by the Trump administration uh, uh, to ban bump stocks um, is thrown out, that ban tossed out by the Supreme Court. <laughs> You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's get to Tesla back in the news again. It looks like our good friend Elon Musk is going to get that pay reward uh, that he believes and now his shareholders believe that uh, he deserves. David Welch joins us, <laughs> Detroit Bureau Chief for uh, Bloomberg News. David, talk to us about what this pay package is for from Tesla for Elon Musk and, and kind of what does it mean for the company? So this was a, a big package negotiated involving stock, stock options, uh, going back, uh, I think, to 2018. And the controversy is that shareholders said that this is a rubber stamp board put in place by Elon. They didn't really uh, have a great view into what they were getting, so spurred a bunch of lawsuits. And uh, Delaware Chancery Court ruled in the shareholders' favor, it's expected to be under appeal, uh, but shareholders approved it. And, and mm -hmm. so that really complicates things uh, as we get into the appeal that shareholders who feel aggrieved are going to go into court saying that they didn't know uh, what they were getting and it's not a good deal, even though the majority of shareholders who hold the stock now approve the deal. Uh, the other thing that they passed is that uh, Tesla will change its domicile to Texas, where the headquarters already is. Uh, more business-friendly laws there. And so if this, uh, if Tesla wins its appeal, uh, or even if they lose it, Elon and the, and the board could just create another similar uh, pay package for him in Texas under Texas law, and then <laughs> they would probably start this cycle all over again, but it would be in a different court that, that could be more friendly to the company and to Elon Musk. So, uh, you know, this, this is far from over, this whole fight over the pay package. Uh, what it does mean sort of near term right now is the shareholders are, are endorsing Elon Musk and they're saying, yeah. look, we, you know, this is the guy we want to stick with, uh, win, lose or draw on, on the legal actions. So are we done talking about it now? Like, I mean, are we done? <laughs> uh, well, w what else does it mean for Tesla? Uh, you know, the, the bigger issues, I think, for this company. Uh, well, sure, but no, I know the but, bigger issues. But before we move on, like in terms of the pay package drama, that book is closed. No, it's far from closed because okay. the, the 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 Delaware. So Tesla appealed the judge's ruling. So there's going to be another round of of litigation on this thing, and who knows how far it could go. Now, and that's what I mean. So let's suppose the shareholders win, 
and Elon doesn't get his pay package because the court overturns it. What would probably happen is the Tesla board would come up with another similar package. So it would be an all new one, maybe of similar value structure, uh, however you want to do it for Elon Musk, but they would do it now that the company is domiciled in Texas, they do it under Texas law. The fact that they changed their domicile to Texas doesn't matter for this lawsuit because the, the pay package was done when Texas was a Delaware, or when Tesla was a Delaware corporation. And so the pay package, uh, what the board did, and the litigation involved is all done under, under Delaware law. Yeah. Tesla's leaving Delaware. Elon's taken a couple of his companies, including mm-hmm. X, out of Delaware. And he's all he doesn't like being regulated. He doesn't like the laws there. So he's he's left. He's even going to send them a cake uh, with a parting shot that he's leaving Delaware. But, um, you know, so if you you know, even if you, you you have this next round of litigation, even if the shareholders win, they could just come up with another package that rewards him and you could have this fight all over again. So many more chapters I'm to go in the pay package yeah. dispute. Just pay the guy. Who cares? Yeah. So, okay, you were trying to then talk about the broader industry, <laughs> and I made you go into the lawsuit well, again. Uh, so how do they tie together? Well, what what the shareholders are basically saying is, despite the fact that, that Tesla as a, as a growth company has kind of stalled out, they still believe Elon Musk is the guy to take them there. And and the, the challenge that he faces now to deliver on Tesla still being a tech company, still being a growth company, is... He either has to recharge, so to speak, their electric vehicle sales. And they've stalled out for a number of reasons, particularly in the U.S. One is the cars are old and kind of stale. They, they all have the same look to them, and they haven't freshened it up. The Model S has looked the same for 12 years now, and everything else is sort of a derivative of that stylistically. And then there's just a lot more competition. You have mm-hmm. Ford, General Motors, BMW, Mercedes, very aggressive in the U.S., uh, and, and you have the Chinese Uh, EV makers in China, in Europe, very aggressive as well. So he's got a lot more competition than he had a few years ago in all these markets. So it's tougher to get growth, which is why he's moving to this. We're an autonomous vehicle AI company. And we'll see what happens in August when when they show us that. But that's going to be a tough one. I mean, you've got Cruise and you've got Waymo out there for years now trying to show that they can develop robo-taxis. And it's it's really tough to make that work. But that's what's going to convert. And yep. shareholders that it's a tech company. All right, David, we'll thank see. you so much. We appreciate that. As always, David Welch, Detroit Bureau Chief for Bloomberg News, giving us the latest update on our good friend Elon Musk and Tesla uh, working towards getting that pay package uh, passed for him. $56 billion. That gets mm. your attention. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Malik Steele alongside Paul Sweeney. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business and economics through our lens of Bloomberg Intelligence analysts. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. I just want to point out here that the CAC 40 is down uh, another 3% today. Uh, So we are picking up some steam as we are about a one hour away from the close of European trading. So keep your eye on that. I'm very high volume as well. In the bond market, you're seeing a continued bid into the bond market. Is it the Fed? Is it safe haven? There are lots of different theories uh, out there as well. But over the the whole week so far, the 10-year is down 22 basis points. That's a pretty solid move. So we want to get more on that with Priya Misra, Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at J.P. Morgan Asset management. Uh, she joins us now. Priya, um, well, I think it was Barclays came out and said, like, look, it's gone too far. Like, w- like we want to short here a little bit. Th- this buying move has gone too far. What do you think? I don't agree. I mean, I think there's been a perfect storm the last couple of weeks. Growth is slowing. Inflation is finally decelerating. I think we can put that first quarter high inflation prints behind us. We realize that was an outlier, not, not the start of a reacceleration. So you have growth and inflation both slowing. You know, I think the market's really pricing for growth to slow down to a little below potential, but we don't know. You know, the the jury's out there. Plus, we have this political risk which is out there. And we're heading into an illiquid summer. I mean, next week itself, we have a holiday in the middle of the week. I think people are getting nervous about the carry trade unwind. And that's what we've seen a little bit this week. 
So I'm not sure it's done. I would not be selling into this, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to treasuries. I actually think people who've been positioned for a soft landing, which we have been, we've been owning high quality spread product, risky assets. I think actually owning some treasuries is a good hedge because there is really only one safe haven asset in a world where inflation is declining and that's still treasuries. And we're not pricing in that much. We're still above, you know, north of uh, of 4% on the 10 year. So I actually think you're supposed to own those hedges. You're supposed to have liquid assets alongside any of those soft landing trades that you have on. Priya, what is a high quality spread product? So I'm glad you asked that because it is across the, you know, whether it's investment rate credit, high yield. I think there are parts of high yield that I would say are high quality, uh, securitized credit, so within the ABS, CMBS sector. So I think you dig in, you look at what the companies or uh, structures, you know, what is that money being used for? If there's good cash flow, we looked at some of these single family rental, you know, there it's a business model where you're earning cash flow based on people paying rent, uh, which we know that rent, uh, you know, rents are, are high. Um, so I think making sure you know the business model, there's free cash flow, there's no re-leveraging of the company or the structure. I think owning that in a diversified way. So we own, you know, IG credit, so investment grade credit, high yield credit, securitized credit. I think that's what we would call, um, you know, most of them in the index, many of them not in the aggregate index. So these would be bonds where you're earning that spread for the fact that you're taking on some credit risk, mm -hmm. some less liquidity risk, that's what you're giving up, but you're picking up that spread because corporate fundamentals are still very, very strong. And so that's what we're, that's why we still like high quality spread product because this is not like other times when there's been a lot, lot of leveraging up or companies are not doing the right thing with their money. I think as long as you dig in, you realize what you're buying, there's a lot of opportunity within fixed income here. So it's just to be clear, it's, it's credit risk, but it's calculated credit risk, but duration risk is a no-no? No, I think it's now it's getting to levels where duration risk is attractive too. I know we might be disappointed with the Fed. The Fed sort of moved to one cut this year. I think the Fed has a little bit of PTSD from what happened hmm. earlier this year, where they signal rate cuts by June and then we get three months of very st uh, strong inflation numbers. And so I think the Fed is very much data dependent. But I think owning some duration, owning some five-year treasuries or 10-year treasuries is attractive because, you know, I mean, we can debate whether they, the first cut is in September or December, but let's look at total amount of cuts. The market is pricing in the end point after all these cuts to be 375. The Fed's own estimate for long run dot is 275. There's a 100 basis point spread. I think in a soft landing, the Fed's cutting to 3%. So there's room for uh, rates to decline in that five to 10 year part of the curve. In a hard landing, so if things slow down more, the Fed has told us they're going to be aggressive. They're going to cut much more than that neutral rate. So I think owning duration risk, and I've been nervous around duration risk while inflation was high. I think we take a lot of comfort with some of the inflation numbers we're getting. The totality of the data, wages slowing down, you know, inflation expectations being anchored. The inflation data itself telling you it's really shelter and auto insurance. So if the inflation fear can be put a little bit in the rear view mirror, I think owning some duration risk here, particularly as we're going into an illiquid environment where some of the growth data is showing signs of cracking, I think, uh, I think you should own some duration risk as well, some fives and tens. Hey Priya, let's say I'm an analyst uh, at JP Morgan Asset Management. I cover you know, the cable, the high yield, the telecommunications sector in, in the high yield space. If I come into your office and say, I love this industry, I think you should be buying some of these cable and telecom bonds. Do you care about calls like that or do you just buy credit metrics, ratings metrics, that kind of thing? How are you in terms of giving some weight to certain industries? Yeah, so I think in general, we like to overweight industries, you know, utilities which have the whole electrification or anything linked to AI. So I think we think of industries that are sort of growth industries, industries of the future, versus those that are not. So I think we'll do that work. Okay. But then you have to look at valuation. At some point, if a company is still going to be around, I mean, there are cable companies, I'll tell you, which may not seem like they're the companies of the future, but they have solid cash flow. They have plans to reduce some of that leverage, and we own some of those in our funds. And then we look at valuation. Where are those spreads? And if they're, they're you know, they might be double B, single B, there are certainly some cable companies in that range. 
it can offer value. I think what you'd want to think about is diversifying those forms of return, mm -hmm. particularly we're going into an election time period where there will be wider dispersion. So I actually think I would listen carefully, ask the questions, understand what the company's plans are for the debt that they're raising, where are levels. And I think there's value even in a sector which you might say have structural challenges. Mm -hmm. Before we let you go, I just want to end on Europe, because as I was mentioning, the CAC 40 is down 3%. You are seeing a bid into the bond market um, over in Europe, but it's been a really tough week uh, for France. Um, and the spread just really blowing out between France and German uh, tenure. Um, is there a trade here for you? You know, not yet. Um, I still think there's a washout that's happening. I mean, the periphery, whether it was France or Italy, were very consensus long carry trades. But at some point, I have to think, we're not talking about France leaving the Eurozone. So at some point, we'd want to dip in, I think, closer to the election. I will say I hesitate trading political risk. It's impossible mm -hmm. to really trade it by very binary risks. But at some point, I think if those spreads widen out another 20, 30 basis points, I think we can start to leg into it. I wouldn't bet the farm on it because, again, you know, political risk, and we saw this for so many years in the European uh, crisis, mm -hmm. it's difficult and things can sp a little bit spill out of control as people de-risk. But I think the fundamentals are still strong. Let's see, even if you get the worst case scenario from a market standpoint, yeah. will they deliver and will they talk about as much spending that is being talked about? I think there's a campaign season and then what actually yeah. gets done. So I think we we'll look at details, we we'll look at polls. And at some point, but I, I think we were still in the early innings of the war. Yeah, and Priya, it's fair enough. I mean, that's what we saw over in Italy with Georgia Maloney. Um, it wasn't as bad as everyone was worried about. Priya Misra, fixed income portfolio manager, J.P. Morgan, asset management. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, for the month of June, folks, Bloomberg Radio is committed to bringing you segments and guests focused on the topic of equality. Earlier in the week, guest host Jess Metton and I spoke with Yin McGuire, president and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council. We first asked her to talk to us about where we are in this country in terms of implementing diversity. There is a surge um, in litigation as a part of very ideological, well-funded and well-coordinated uh, effort among a small group of organizations that are completely out of a step uh, with the vast majority of, of Americans. Um, we have a, a, a thought leadership partner called Public Private Strategies Institute. They commissioned a um, morning consult study that uh, a few, few months ago, and the study found that majority of uh, corporate senior executives across all political affiliations that support the diversity initiative. They believe that diversity initi initiatives played a critical role uh, in the success of their companies. For example, 75% of them uh, self-described as conservatives. 77% uh, described themselves as moderates and 89% are liberals. And all of them recognizing the positive uh, contribution of diversity initiatives uh, to their business performance. And so th these lawsuits really are part of larger strategies uh, to, to constrain the ability of business leaders to make decisions for the benefits of their companies. And, um, you know, I came to this country uh, with the one suitcase and $1,000 to pursue <laughs> my American dream. And because I believe America is supposed to be a place that, uh, when has a freedom to achieve, has a freedom to earn, and has freedom to make decisions, and has freedom to prosper. And so we're seeing an organized movement to stifle that freedom. Of uh, Do you think this is mostly political driven, or is it shareholders saying, I I'm just not sure you've proven to me that it's in the best interest of me as a shareholder to pursue diversity? I think it's political driven. And it's ideological movement. Uh, we have, you know, NMSCC made up hundreds of thousands of uh, 
corporations. And so we have daily dialogues with corporate executives, and they believe in the value of diversities. Sometimes people don't like the words D E and I. So then let's find the new words. You know, the, the, but the 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 outcome uh, of uh, the diversity initiative is yielding uh, positive business results. It's, it's a good, just good for the business. When you're talking about the American dream and then also corporate America, some of the strides that have been made, but still some pitfalls there. Where do those pitfalls stand? Because you were talking about the litigations. Where are those issues and, and why are there those litigations? What are they involved in? So uh, the litigation, as I shared earlier, is a really uh, ideological, uh, well-organized uh, effort to uh, block the participation uh, for underserved group uh, into our economic lives. And um, and it's not new. So the attack on diversity and opposition to economic equity has been there for a very long time. But if you look at data and the facts, it, it says otherwise. You know, it's very different from what you're hearing in the media, right? So, for example, um, McKinsey's and the company reported that companies that are more culturally diverse, actually they yield, I think, 37% more profitability than the average companies. And diverse suppliers who we serve, and they actually provide in the range of, you know, little less than 9% cost savings compared to average companies uh, they realize about three to seven percent procurement savings. So, so there are tremendous economic value for diversity initiatives in corporate America. What about minority businesses? So the minority businesses, um, they are ready to compete. Uh, every day we work with them to certify them, uh, to develop them, to connect them to opportunities, relationships, and a capital. And we have businesses, you know, they started as a startup, a small business, and, and they grew to be a mid-size and to large-size businesses. And we have businesses out there, for example, one of our certified MBEs actually helped design and build finance LaGuardia Airport. I was mm -hmm. I was walking through the LaGuardia Airport. I was it looks so a lot impressed. nicer now, yes, doesn't it, Paul, better. right? Yes. <laughs> After the construction to, over the last decade. I used to avoid LaGuardia Airport, but right. since the reconstruction it's by so our now. MBEs, like, mm -hmm. I actually want to fly to LaGuardia now, <laughs> right? I don't want everyone to know, though, because it's so easy to get there from my apartment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's a secret. Commute is easier, right? Yeah. We have uh, MBEs. They are designing, building natural gas power plants and so they're definitely contributing to our economy every single day and actually we're releasing the 2023 uh, minority business economic impact study and you're going to see some of the uh, reports come out i'm very pleased to share that nmsdc certified minority-owned businesses generated about 363 billion dollar in annual revenue mm. and that is uh 550 billion dollar economic output two million jobs and 149 billion dollar in wages so and if we continue that uh trend that we can actually reach a trillion dollar goal for nmsdc certified mbes by 2030 and that's 1.5 trillion dollar uh, economic output right and a four million jobs. So I, I know you and other advocacy leaders recently sent a letter to Fortune 500 companies advocating for DEI. What's been the response to that letter? Any follow up? Yes, uh, I'm very proud to uh, stand with eleven other CEOs of a, a broad range of business organizations representing Black, Asian, Latino, women, LGBTQ, uh, disability, veteran-owned businesses. We represent seventy plus. The percent American. And uh, we wrote open letter to Fortune 500 company CEOs, really share with them the business cases for diversity, and really encourage them to continue to invest in these initiatives. 
and it has been tremendously positive. And in fact, we're in uh, ongoing dialogue with them, continue to share best practices and, and problem solving. In fact, I was with a Fortune 500 company CEO and talking about, you know, people just need to stop debating on the term and the words and with the feelings. Mm -hmm. And we just need to understand why corporations are doing it and why they are doing it. And corporations just need more choices of suppliers, including uh, inclusion of diverse suppliers so they can build resilient supply chain. And the corporation is going to need more diverse talents so they can build product services to diverse customer base, right? So it's, it's really a pure, simple business, good business. Yep. All right, that was Ying McGuire, president and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council, talking about uh, diversity uh, in the workforce, in the economy, and she represents the suppliers all throughout uh, the country. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.